Hello and welcome to CIPR TV, brought to you by Marketers for DC and the CIPR Social Media Panel. I'm Philip Sheldrake. In today's show, we'll be debating the 2000 page Leveson report and the impact it has had to both journalists and public relations professionals. Simply put, there's mutual dependence between the media and PR, but also mutual caution. However we characterise this relationship, there is no doubt that both professions flourish under each other's watch. And whilst journalism may bear the brunt of the recommendations proposed by Lord Leveson in his report, they will also have an impact on the public practice of public relations too. Joining me in the studio today to debate Lord Leveson's findings are representatives, if you like, from both sides of the fence. Michelle Stanistreet, General Secretary of the National Union of Journalists, and Jane Wilson, CEO of the CIPR. Welcome to you both. Hi. Hi. And as usual, you can join in the discussion too. If you have a question for Michelle or Jane, you can use the submission box on the page right in front of you now, or tweet, or indeed any comments about the show, just using the hashtag hash CIPRTV. Let's crack on. It's three, three working days since the report emerged. What's your take, Jane? Well, I've read the full report three times over. <laughs> of course, 2,000 pages. <laughs> yes. Um, Broadly, I think it's it's as people expected. The interesting thing is, the guy down the pub probably says, "Yeah, that's what I would have come out of." Mm -hmm. It's it's fair. It suggests something that's independent, and it suggests something um, that has ability to to have a mechanism for hearing complaints. But most of all, is that something is other than the, um, the the newspaper industry, and I think that's the most important part of it. So, a possible improvement on the P press complaints commission, to say the least. To, to say, say the, the least. least. Michelle, what about your members? What's your collective take on, on, on the state of this? Well, there are certainly some aspects of the report's findings that we have some reservations about any potential changes to data protection legislation mm -hmm. or um, enhancements to PACE or off-the-record comments. Those kind of things we have real concerns about. But on the fundamental issue of how we improve the regulatory system, I think Leveson's got much to recommend it. And I think the focus on a new independent system that's genuinely accountable, that includes the public in a way that the PCC simply hasn't done, and it hasn't involved journalists in the industry either. I mean, I think those things would be a vast improvement on, on what we're currently um, have at the moment with the PCC. Oh, am I looking at this as a show with violent agreement? You both seem <laughs> oh, to be saying the same thing. I'm sure we'll find something, but I think we'll what's really something. important here is that interesting um, talking about the public, mm. because the question one must always ask mm. is, well, in what way does this serve the public? In what way does it serve the public interest? And actually there were some really interesting recommendations about perhaps looking at a revision of the code and putting that out to public consultation. Can you, can you imagine suggesting that the public would be involved in, in, in the, the, the editor's code and the code for journalists to work to? I think that's, there are some nuggets in there that I haven't necessarily made the headlines over the last few days. And I don't think there's, I mean, fundamentally, there's nothing really wrong with the code, whether it's the editor's code or whether it's the NUJ's own code of conduct that our members sign up to. It's been about how that's worked in practice. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, the, the PCC, in our view, has been a bit of an old boys club for, mm -hmm. for so, so many years now. And it's served the interests of, of very small vested interests part of the industry, the editors and the owners. And I think it's about reaching out and diluting that um, control and participation so that members of the public for whom the press is there to serve and to reflect actually take a part, a big part of the new system of regulation in a way that um, is a bit more of a co-regulatory approach. And we've had that situation in Ireland where the NUJ also represents members in Ireland and we have a, a new press council there that's been working over the last few years which is underpinned by statute and it um, is co-regulatory in the sense that it has the, a majority of members of the public who are part of that panel and I think that makes a big difference. Well, we'll, we'll return to that nuance in a moment but there's one phrase you used early on there which was uh, there's nothing wrong with the code of conduct. In that case has it just been that the conduct hasn't followed the code? Well, there are elements of the editor's code that we'd like to see changed. We think the NUJ has got by far the best code in the industry. Okay. So, you know, obviously we'd love them to adopt our own code. But, but fundamentally, the codes have been there, but actually in practice they've been not being implemented and upheld. And that's the big difference. It's about the industry um, being genuinely accountable and, and the editors kind of not marking their own homework, as it's been called by many. Not marking their own homework. In other words, self-regulation doesn't work. Oh, I think that's, that's a bit simplistic because 
I was just just paraphrasing what Michelle was saying. There. But self regulation can be self regulation by an industry using independent um, structures, independent mechanisms, and sources and people. So, for instance, if you have six editors sitting around a table opining on something, you're you're more likely to get um, come to to a conclusion that supports them. Um, and so, you can, I think you can have self regulation, but ensure that there's independence there within it and also really look at the balance of, of power and I think a lot of the, the problems we've had have been about those um, the, the power that exists between organisations, government, individuals, media owners, mm. journalists and as the power shifts more towards one of those groups of people um, and there's not something effective there to, to balance it, that's where you get instances such as we've seen um, uh, recently in the press and so I think this new organisation has to look at balance of power and has to look at where that sits and it must stay far, far away from government. Before we go on to that point in a little more detail, let me just remind viewers that you can submit your question at any time on the form in front of you or indeed with hashtag hash CIPR TV. And we're just getting a couple of questions coming in that way at the moment. I'll get to those in a moment. But could I ask one of you who'd like to take this, who'd like to dis define statutory underpinning? <laughs> Don't fight. For well, it. This has been something that's just been dominating um, the whole debate on this, I think. I mean, what, what happened in the run-up to Leveson's report as they got kind of closer to D-Day, I think what we saw was, you know, elements of the press becoming increasingly hysterical and talking about any kind of underpinning in the future being akin to um, state control of the press and, you know, it would be one small step to Zimbabwe or Iran for the UK, which is obviously daft. Statutory regulation is not a synonym for state regulation, is it? No, no. And, and, and statutory underpinning is absolutely not um, statutory regulation. You know, we don't think there's a big distinction between the two. I think it's about having a mechanism in law for the creation of a new body that's genuinely independent. And I is think that it's how as simple your, as that. Your members in broadcast... Uh, subject to a similar mechanism today and since the birth of broadcast, I believe. Absolutely, and, and under Ofcom's auspices. And, and broadcasting is a completely different beast, I think, in many ways to the press. But I think what's really important in all of this argument that Leveson absolutely has not recommended mm -hmm. any involvement of par parliament or government in the, in the control of the press. It, absolutely not. It's not about the, the regulation or involvement on content, which is the fundamental thing, or about people's um, choices to publish anything that they want to. This is about having a body that deals with complaints, that investigates problems, that is genuinely independent of the, the bigwigs in the industry, the owners and the editors. It's about having something that's, you know, a, a system of whether it's self-regulation or it ends up being underpinned, having something that's genuinely independent and arm's length from the industry. I think that's vital because otherwise you don't get the proper balance of power. What I found quite incredible is the response of the newspapers to the report, particularly this weekend when they apparently broke the supposed bombshell that Shami Chakrabarti from Liberty uh, disagreed with Lord Leveson about statutory underpinning, when all along it was included in the 2000 word report <laughs> that came out on the Thursday. And actually there was no bombshell, it was just the report says a link to Ofcom could be a last resort and Shami is saying no, I don't think that should be a last resort. So it's a, it's a nuance and yet the press breaks this as a bombshell. I don't understand why we can't have a more intelligent debate about this situation. Because the deb debates become so polarised because those people who are controlling the, the rhetoric that's coming from these newspapers have got have they have got what they see as a lot to lose they're going to they're going to lose power from the system that they currently have which which has been a form of self regulation but it's been very much on the boss's terms it hasn't shared the power or, or broadened participation it's been very much uh, a group of people that have served their own interests for such a long time and they're, they're very annoyed about any potential change to the status quo and i think all of the reaction whether it's been since the report or before has been informed with that kind of a spirit. I was accused in the Sun's leader a couple of weeks ago of being the most dangerous trade union leader in Britain and of being absolutely well, hell-bent. so got to go on your LinkedIn profile. <laughs> I'm going to frame it. <laughs> a a hell-bent on um, turning the UK into Zimbabwe or Iran with our press run by Stalinist state stooges. Now, I can tell you now <laughs> that's obviously not my view or Isn't that of incredible? the NUJ, but I mean, this is, you know, some of the people in the industry have gone bonkers about Well, the Daily Mail described Shami's bombshell, uh, they embraced it. 
when they thought she of was course. going against Leveson. And yet, thought we should see that day. I know. <laughs> just a few months ago, they were calling you know the Human Rights Act a harbour for criminals and parasites. They don't have to chop and change. Absolutely. And Charmaine's made it perfectly clear this morning that actually she's not keen on Ofcom as being the, the potential backstop if, if the industry do, doesn't opt into this system. I mean, I think that's critical. The industry can choose not to be part of this mm. new body. Nobody's forcing them to. There'll be some carrots to entice them to be part of it, but they're not going to be, there's not going to be, Levson's not going to be standing there instructing them to be part of this new group. Well, they will have the choice. There's an interesting question coming on that compulsion side of things. Uh, from Angela Podmore of Kinetic Communications. She says, uh, Ian Hislop and other heavyweight journalists agree that all the law is in place. So what obstacles do you guys think? Uh, uh, is Leveson trying to resolve? I think part of he, Leveson touches on this. He says, you know, people say that the laws are in place, for instance, on phone hacking. Mm. How come... Um, uh, the, the Press Complaints Commission was able to get in and, and get access on, 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 on sorry, Levison was able to get access on phone hacking in a way that the PPC couldn't. Well, two things happened there. One, they didn't have the powers of investigation, which this new body would hopefully have. Uh, and secondly, it was a closed shop. News of the World weren't opening their doors and letting people in. And without that, that push to then hand that over to the police and say, we think there's something mm -hmm. here to, to deal with, there wasn't as much transparency as there should be. The laws were there, and I think we probably, I think if there's one thing the Levison process has done, it's probably opened the public eyes to what goes on. And I actually think on the point of incentives, perhaps one of the biggest incentives is people going out and buying your newspaper and what they think about how you report and what they think about your standards. And, and this body has to be about standards as much as, as, much as complaints. And I guess the NUG will have a very strong view in that. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a great believer that the laws are there, they're in place, and they have to be better applied. There is a question, of course, that only rich people can afford the law. And I think one of the issues in terms of the incentives will be for the industry, for the publishers of being part of the new body, as Leveson prescribes, it will be that if they're part of this new body and this new club, then actually there will be a benefit if um, people make complaints in terms of having going to that new body first rather than going down the libel laws which only the rich and powerful can really afford to exploit in this country and so I think that will be a big enticement for members of the industry and, and it's happened that way in Ireland. But I just wanted to follow up because what you were saying about um, the kind of culture, Leveson was also you know it was part of that inquiry was looking at the culture of our newsrooms and one of the things the NUJ did was bring evidence about um, the problems of day-to-day of, of -day life in far too many newsrooms with journalists being bullied. Um, we gave evidence on behalf of journalists who were too frightened to come forward to the inquiry in person so we, we, we did it anonymously um, and I think one of the really brilliant things that is contained within the 2,000 pages of the report for us is a recommendation that there should be a conscience clause for journalists in, in individual journalist mm. contracts, which is something that the NUJ has been campaigning on for about 15 years. And the industry, the PCC and the Society of Editors, they've consistently refused um, to implement that. And it, that is a, a good step in the right direction. It won't solve the problems that led to hacking, but it'll give journalists more confidence to be able to raise issues about um, journalistic ethics without fearing that actually they're going to be told by their boss not to bother coming into work the next day right. or, or yeah. sacked. And it's actually, that, that's, that's heightened um, uh, increase in, in speed of news, the news cycle speeding up, greater technology, hugely different commercial environments um, and the pressures that are on journalists. Yeah. In some ways, I've heard people uh, lodge the criticism that this is 20th century legislation for the 21st century and actually lots of things moved on, have mm. moved on since the last time we, we, we looked at um, press um, conduct. But I do think these things have to be taken into well, account, both the commercial and the, the technological advances. That's a perfect segue, Jane. Thanks for setting me <laughs> up welcome, for two Phil. questions here uh, on a very similar point. One from at Gem Griff, Gemma Griffiths, um, who presents this show from time to time. And also from, uh, forgive me if I mispronounce your name, Kaomi Buckley. Uh, they're both asking about an apparent neglect for social media. Do you think it was neglected or was it just all wrapped up in terms of the output of the press? Levson certainly mentioned it and he said, you know, he, he himself admitted those commercial and technological changes that have happened and the pressures that are happening. It wasn't the remit of this particular um, and inquiry is, is my take from it, but I don't think one can ignore it, partly because 
of the he touched on it a bit in plurality he talks about um um, the fact that, that newspapers are in more spaces than just print and one has to consider that. Um, but then you've got journalists themselves blogging and texting and you've got others who are completely outside the, the media industry mm. affecting it. And certainly from a public relations point of view, we've seen our jobs change entirely. No longer is public relations synonymous with media relations. And so I do think there's a gap there, but that is that is perhaps a, maybe a mark too. I'm just not sure whether that would sit inside a body that governs the press and the press is so specifically different in the UK to all other forms of media and news and reporting. Michelle, put you I, on the spot, just if I may just rephrase mm. the question for you, just to put you on the spot. <laughs> Should The Sun have published Prince Harry's photographs from Las Vegas? Oh gosh, <laughs> <laughs> it's quite different. Um, but that was online, you see, they could update their online presence. But they said the, the photographs were already online, Curie D. We can publish them too. I, I think I think um, you could probably argue, um, forge an argument on the back of security and public interest in a way that you couldn't do with the topless pictures of Kate. I think that the two cases were quite different and quite distinct. Um, just just following up though on the issue of social media and online, because Leveson has been criticised in recent days. I think it's about five or six pages. I think is, is, is devoted to this out of such a huge, vast report. But I think the reality is is that when he's talking about the press, he's talking about the big players in the industry in the UK, and it includes their operations, whether they're online or you know whatever platform they're publishing on, whether it's their newspapers in in print or whether it's online, they would come under this new body. But I think what's interesting as well is that because it's an opt-in um, creation, anybody could join it. Um, and I know the Huffington Post and others are considering whether or not actually they would sign up to this kind of new scheme. So I think it's got the potential to grow in a way that reflects the reality of the, the market, not just the traditional newspapers. So, but you, so you personally, just to revisit my original question, wouldn't separate a media company's output online from print? No, it's absolutely not. I mean, even even currently, I, 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 even I currently under the, under the, the current PCC, but, uh, but no, absolutely, it would go by um, by the organisation, not not by the platform that the whether you know it's on on the app or whether it's online or whether it's podcasts they're doing. But of course, though, that's it. It's it's not just lots of um, press owners will be looking more. I mean, who would have thought the Guardian are considering? scrapping its, its, its print edition mm. and it will go to look much more like a traditional broadcast media organisation and I, I think things are changing so fast mm. we will have to, this will need more revisiting in the next few years. So is David Cameron right or is he wrong? Which side of the political divide do you fall on? It sounds to me like you're on the Prime Minister's side of the, uh, the House. No, I'm absolutely not. I mean, I, I, I. But you argued earlier that we don't necessarily need statutory. I think it's very likely we do. I, I, oh, I, my apologies, I, I, I am very. You. I would be open to any alternatives that could create a genuinely independent system. But mm -hmm. I think our experience of the PCC and that form of self-regulation, as these um, newspapers have known it and loved it for so many years, I'm sceptical about how we get from where we are now to a genuinely independent system. I, I think. The reality is that we know at the moment that um, all of the main editors are, are gathering in different meetings this week to talk about how to implement a new body. And I think if they genuinely want it to be a change and a departure from the status quo, then it should be an incredibly inclusive process. They should be at this stage, including representatives from the kind of wider public sphere. They should be including talks with the NUJ on behalf of working journalists, 35,000 journalists in the UK. And that would, to me, demonstrate that actually they really do want to do things differently in the future. Until that happens, I'm sceptical, and I think a lot of politicians are as well, and there's broad cross-party consensus on the need for uh, a mechanism to ensure it's independent. And, and, and that's where I think the issue of the underpinning comes in. And David Cameron did say, when we embarked upon this inquiry, which has cost us all, as members of the public, mm. five million quid, uh, he did say he would implement its findings unless it was bonkers. I do not think that anyone can read that report and think it's bonkers. Jane, do you come to a similar conclusion? We're just approaching the end of the show, so Probably I'm going to ask you to sort of more to the sum up. Skeptical, but hopeful. Mm. And I would mm. hope that the press and its history of freedom in this country can be preserved without um, uh, the need for uh, changes in statutes. But I, I am with you; it will require action it will require things to be done differently but that is exactly what this is suggesting because we've been here six times before over the last few decades almost 
we, we've not I quite. Think we've had a three we've not, royal reviews. Or, there's um, been a lot of drinking in the last chance saloon. Yeah. <laughs> It's time um, to get out of that bar. John Major said it would be the politicians that are drinking yeah. in the last chance saloon yeah. and not the, the journalists if they don't go for this. When will we see action? That's my last question to you both. When do you think the game will change? I think things are happening pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. there's, there's the debate in Parliament as we speak. It's happening right now. And um, there's various meetings lined up this week. Both sides now, we have the Tories who are putting together a, a bill, um, presumably with the intent of showing it's going to be too cumbersome and it's not possible. So Labour have announced today that they're doing their own bill to show it's possible and um, easy to have statutory underpinning. And they're aiming to do that in two weeks. So I think come, come the new year, mm. we're going to be in a, an interesting position, I think. I don't think there's the... I don't think anybody wants to see this just kind of be kicked into the long grass for months to come. So I, I think it will be quite a fast pace. So that was my last question to you both, but I have one last question for Jane, which is, of course, as per our intro today, we have ramifications for the public relations industry. Yes. And we've had CIPR TV shows on UCPAC in terms of registering of lobbyists, mm -hmm. and also you've just introduced on the CIPR website a register of CIPR members. What's the, what's the take? What should we look out from? Our side, of, our side of the fence, so to speak. Well, I'm not looking for a register of a journalist where it's a licensed to operate. I think that, that would be a horrible place to be. Um, but I guess it's, it's more transparent, honest dealings um, and interestingly, perhaps an end to off the record. Who knows? <laughs> well, uh, I'll leave the show. Thank you very much for taking part and providing such lucid arguments for the report, I think I'm fair in saying you're both genuinely supportive uh, and it's going to be interesting in 2013 to see it all take shape. Uh, we have a, a tweet in from David C who does say, would the CIPR, and I'm sure he means the NUJ as well, like to join him in congratulating Kate and Wills on the announcement of their first baby? <laughs> So I guess uh, we, we can't ignore the, the big news of December. Forget Leveson, we have a new royal on the way. Uh, wish them both luck. Uh, so the 40-odd page executive summary and the full report, if you fancy 2,000 words, 2,000 pages, I should say, are available at levisoninquiry.org.uk. Thanks again to Jane and Michelle for taking part today, to the production team here at Marketeers 4DC, and of course, to you for watching and taking part. Don't forget you can download and watch this episode of CIPR TV and the whole back catalogue via the iTunes store or at CIPR TV. That's all from us for 2012. Keep an eye out for details of the first show in the new year. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>